And thank you, Alicia, and welcome everyone. I'm Carolyn Jacobs in the Education Department at GBH, calling in from my home in Southern Maine. Uh, we are recording and we'll send the links to the recording, the slide deck, and a very robust resource document in an email that will come to you tomorrow, about 24 hours after this um, webinar. It comes right from Zoom. Uh, the resource document includes links to everything that you're going to see tonight, plus a lot more. Don't miss it and feel free to send it to your colleagues and share it. We're using Zoom webinar as our platform. Only the presenters are on camera and have the mic. If your chat is set to um, host and panelists, please make sure it's set to everyone so that we all can see your comments. Denise Olson, Director of Marketing at GBH Education, is monitoring the chat. She'll be posting some links, answering some of your questions, and she'll also be um, passing the questions along to the panelists in our Q&A at the end. We will try to get to your questions during the presentation, but if not, again, we've reserved some time at the end. GBH um, is Boston's PBS station and the creator of iconic series that you see on your local PBS station in your own cities and towns. You probably recognize some of these um, logos and that represent programs and a particular interest to ELA teachers, of course, is Masterpiece, and then American Experience and Frontline and lots of programs for kids. And in the education department at GBH, We've been producing educational materials for pre-K to 12 for 40 years, and we make everything available at no cost. In collaboration with PBS, GBH co-founded and co-manages the platform PBS Learning Media, and you will learn much more about that in a couple of minutes. I hope that you, some of you are already familiar with PBS Learning Media. First, I want to uh, mention that we appreciate greatly the chance to collaborate once again with the National Council for the Social Studies, NCSS, on tonight's session, and for the first time with the National Council of Teachers of English, NCTE. We have Larry Pasca, Executive Director of NCSS, and we have Emily Kirkpatrick, um, Executive Director of NCTE with, with us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Larry for a minute for welcome, and then Emily will follow Larry. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Um, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. We especially want to thank uh, PBS and GBH and all the, the dedicated people who work on PBS Learning Media for this wonderful opportunity. We want to thank our partners at NCTE for their wonderful collaboration and working with us. Um, as a proud parent of, of kids who are in elementary school, um, when they bring home texts that are rich with historical content, when they dive deep and think about um, challenging issues and ask challenging questions about the world around them using um, really great nonfiction, critical text, primary sources, I, I see firsthand how the learning comes alive. And so I'm glad you're with us this evening to share in that passion with us. We want to see meaningful historical, geographical, economic, civic content come alive for all kids um, through the texts that you present and work with in the classroom. So again, thank you for the partnership. If you'd like to learn more about us, if you don't know too much about us yet, or it's been a while since you've checked out our programming, I invite you to visit us at socialstudies.org. Our annual conference is coming up in just a month and a half um, at socialstudies.org forward slash conference to learn more about that. We'll be in Nashville this year and this topic along with many others related to social studies and building literacy in our classrooms uh, will be featured at our conference. So I welcome you there. But anyway, I'm Larry Pasca, Executive Director of NCSS. Pleased that you're with us tonight. And I look forward to continuing this work with you um, through our associations. Good evening. I'm Emily Kirkpatrick, the Executive Director of NCTE. And we are so pleased to be with each of you, each attendee this evening, as well as joining with G WGBH and uh, once again, our ongoing collaborator in CSS. Tonight's webinar shows the interrelationship 
the interconnectedness, the fluidity between English language arts and the study of history and culture. I extend my deep appreciation for NCT's expert on tonight's panel. I'm excited for you to get to learn with and from her, Dr. Lakeisha Odlum. I have been in Dr. Odlum's classrooms and met her students and seen uh, visibly the um, promise of her teaching. And I'm so excited that you get to learn with her tonight. I invite all attendees to become a member of our organization. Um, if you can attend our upcoming convention uh, held the third week in November, you can hear directly from over 300 authors, but most specifically, um, I saw mention of the hate you give in tonight's chat. And uh, Angie Thomas will be with us as a keynote speaker. And uh, I think we've all drawn so very much from her work and know that she has so much more to contribute to the world. Uh, so thank you for being with us tonight. And we look forward to settling in uh, with the webinar conversation. And thank you, Emily and Larry. And yes, um, Lakeisha Odlum is, uh, we, we met her through NCTE and it's been a pleasure getting to know her and working with her. All right, as promised, just a little bit more information about PBS Learning Media before we get started. Many of the resources you're going to see this evening that the presenters are relating to a text you can find on pbslearningmedia.org. Everything is free, of course. It's a platform of thousands of resources for pre-K to 12 across the curriculum, but we are particularly strong in US history, social studies, lots of ELA um, resources also. If you haven't already done so, we encourage you to explore the site, create a free account and begin searching, downloading, saving to folders and sharing resources. And certainly relevant to tonight's topic, I wanna to draw your attention to the US history collection on PBS Learning Media. Over 400 resources. This is a collection that was launched a, a, almost a year ago. Over 400 resources that include clips from PBS series such as American Experience, Frontline, Ken Burns, et cetera, and many other media and interactive resources that develop students' historical thinking and their understanding of the complexity of our history. All right, our presenters this evening. Alicia is a longtime African-American studies teacher in DC public schools, and we're lucky to have her part-time on staff at GBH Education. Dr. Odlum, is uh, a former middle school, longtime middle school ELA and humanities teacher in New York City, and currently an assistant professor of English education and a longtime uh, collaborator with NCTE. Baina Bay is a 24 year veteran teacher of um, English language arts and literature. She currently teaches AP and Honors English. And um, I wanted to get this right because the, the, the type of school that she's in is very specific. She currently teaches English at a, well, she teaches at a Chicago magnet school and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about that later. It's her first time presenting with us and it's been a pleasure getting to know you too, Baina. All right, in the agenda, um, Alicia is gonna kick things off and frame the conversation a little bit with the objectives and the essential question for the webinar. Uh, Baina is gonna pick it up and talk about the crucible and strategies and um, background information and historical context for the crucible. And then Alicia will come on and address the narrative of the life of Fred Frederick Douglass and the Great Gatsby. And Lakeisha will be at the end. The Watsons go to Birmingham and Beloved. And I will come on at the very end for just a few remarks. And again, we'll reserve time at the end for questions. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia. All right, thank you, Carolyn. 
Thank you all for your comments and answers and the warm up. My favorite book to teach is Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. I absolutely love this book. I'm waiting for them to make it into a movie. I thought at one point Holly Berry was picking it up, but not sure about it now. Um, I, I love this book because it gives me an opportunity to really focus on Black women's history, which is my area of specialty, um, an area that oftentimes is overlooked in our classrooms, whether it's in the social studies classroom or whether it's in um, the ELA classroom. Um, but you know, there was a reason that I did specifically ask you this question, not only because you know I'm looking for my, my fall and winter reading list, and you all made some really good suggestions to go back and reread or read for the first time, but also because studies have shown that children can understand the text better if they have some background knowledge about the topic. And also studies show that embedding literacy strategies or instruction into social studies really helps students to retain more vocabulary and understand content better than children who learn science or social studies separately from reading instruction. Next slide. And so this forms the basis of tonight's webinar. Tonight, we will investigate how can an interdisciplinary approach to literature increase student understanding and appreciation for literary texts? And in order to answer this question, we will explore their cross sections between literature and history. We're gonna examine innovative interdisciplinary strategies and resources to deepen student understanding and appreciation for literature. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Bahia, and she will give us some innovative strategies on how to accomplish this when teaching Arthur Miller's The Crucible. Hi, my name is Bahia Bay, and I am a teacher for the Chicago Public Schools. I work at a selective enrollment high school where students have to test to get into the school. I have taught uh, regulars, English, honors, inclusion, and AP in my 24 years. Um, I've been at the same school, and this is my first time presenting with PBS, and it's been a pleasure getting to know um, everyone that I'm working with tonight. Next slide. The Crucible by Arthur Miller uh, was released in 1953, and it is a hugely popular play in four acts about the 1692 Salem Witch Trials. Um, Arthur Miller is a well-known playwright, screenwriter, activist, essayist um, that wrote The Crucible, and he wanted to highlight on the emotional uh, and historical consequences also of the McCarthy era. He sought to shed light on the mass hysteria uh, along that happened during the Salem Witch Trials and to shed some light on the Red Scare. And the McCarthy era personally had a profound impact on the dramatist, affecting him emotionally, politically, socially, and psychologically. Some of the major themes of the crucible are guilt, hysteria, reputation, power, and judgment, along with intolerance. Next slide. One of the strategies in my class, I always begin with a discussion on terms and vocabulary to help students to kind of have a background of what it is that we're studying or covering. So what I do is I go over the term uh, cru crucible with my students and I kind of uh, draw uh, in this particular case, I go over like the meaning of it, a vessel of a melting pot, a test of the most decisive kind, um, a severe trial. Essentially, a crucible is a vessel in which substances are heated to high temperatures, the impure elements being melted away to leave the pure elements behind. 
It also serves for us as an allegory along with a metaphor, a long metaphor in which the stories, characters, or elements represent an external meaning, which is something that we see and is highlighted throughout the crucible. So I actually do a journal entry with my students. It's an in-class activity where I ask my students to do a little research um, on Arthur Miller and uh, why he wrote the play. And I have them to write a well-developed like paragraph and the students share their responses and, with the class. And this helps to facilitate discussion. I also use a web quest um, to give some background information to the author, um, the Salem Witch Cry the Salem Witch Trials also for the McCarthy era. And I have included that in the resources for you guys, a copy of the web, web quest for you guys to have as a resource document. But I think the students uh, actually really love that activity because they're doing a little research and we get a chance to share out with the class. Next slide. The Crucible Inspiration and Reception I use on PBS Learning Media, which is a very, very, very helpful resource. The Crucible was published in 1953 at the peak of the Red Scare and America's increased dread of communist influence. And during this time, um, I have my students to watch this video. It's only like five minutes and um, I give the students a chance to uh, talk about it in class. Sometimes what they do after we watch the clip, it's like two short clips from the American Masters. And what they do is the students usually either answer discussion questions after this video or we sometimes journal. Um, the picture that you see here is a screenshot of a resource that I've used from PBS Learning Media, and it reflects the crucible and its reception during the Hollywood Blacklist. I have used this resource. Um, I particularly like the teaching tips that they give you uh, for this, and you can actually print out and adapt it to your students. The teaching tips suggest that you begin the lesson with a conversation about an allegory and give some examples, background information, handouts, vocabulary supports, discussion questions are all included in the teaching tips. I also like the way that I can differentiate instruction with the PBS learning media resources because in many of our classes, we have diverse learners. So in the resource file, you will see some different things that as teachers, you can use to work with your students. Um, all of the videos are closed captioned. Uh, transcripts are provided, vocabulary support is provided, and the site is fully integrated um, with Google Classroom, which is amazing. Next slide. These are some of the teaching strategies that I use for the Crucible. Um, and I use PBS Learning Media. So one thing when I give the students this assignment or to do at my school, we um, have to you know, let the students know we begin with their objectives. So they either know on the smart board or on the whiteboard what it is that they will be learning today. So sometimes um, as teachers, we can give an active reading guide, um, which is um, guided reading opportunities for students to get a chance to read in class and, you know, share. Um, I also use the speech um, resource on PBS LM to make historical and current connections like with the 1950s Red Scare and the McCarthy era. Um, during this time, 
uh, students are able to discuss modern accusations, fear, hysteria, bullying, suspicion, um, et cetera. And they parallel those things with the play. And they're also able to engage in collaboration activities and or Socratic seminars to discuss the Red Scare and McCarthy era. And they can also discuss the Salem witchcraft trials as well. Um, we discuss technology during this time and social media and how false accusations can spread anonymously, especially, you know, in this day and age. And a lot of our students are often, you know, on into social media and different um, platforms. So the students also are able to make connections to how, how their lives, you know, have been impacted by current events, injustices, Black, Black Lives Matter, poverty, peer pressure, you know, the pandemic, you know, mental health. Um, also, they're able to make parallels of, you know, falsely being accused of things based upon culture, climate, and different communities. Um, I think that, you know, the PBS source is very helpful for the students. Um, this particular speech, the speech that launched the 1950s Red Scare, I give my students the chance to either act it out in class. Um, and I also use like the supporting materials with this selection. They also have discussion questions and for I, our diversity diverse learners. Sometimes I give a graphic organizer so they can put everything together as, you know, a whole and kind of simplify things a bit. Um, next slide, please. So the red, the red scare and the depiction of women in the crucible is something that played, um, a major role in the 1950s. And there is um, a saying that those who don't remember uh, the past are condemned to repeat it. So as we look at history, as we look at English language arts in general, for me being an English teacher, it's essential for me to teach the background information to a piece of literature like The Crucible and many other works that are in uh, the presentation tonight. Um, what I have students to do um, in this case with the depiction you know, of women in the crucible and other texts that we cover is I have them to read and annotate teaching and learning about women's history with the New York Times. That's also in the resource guide for you guys. I usually have them take it home and read and annotate it for homework. Um, it's really important for me as the teacher for them to, to help them understand, you know, history, for them to make that connection to English as well and their personal lives. So in terms of women's roles in the 1950s, it was a very challenging decade, particularly for women of color. And we can see this uh, by one of the main characters, Tatuba, who is a black slave from Barbados. And in the end, she ended up being blamed for, you know, conjuring up spirits, conjuring up the dead. And the crucible, um, you know, it has a lot of, uh, or there's been a lot of debate, I should say, about some of the main characters like Abigail and Elizabeth Proctor and their roles. So the roles um, they are assigned reflect the attitudes about women in the 1950s. When the play was written during the Salem witchcraft trials of 1692, women were being uh, said to be witches and different things of that sort or more likely to sin than men. And Abigail, the most prominent female character in the crucible is portrayed as cunning, evil, and a promiscuous young woman. The crucible depicts a vision of women that reduces them to human stereotypes defined by their roles as mothers, spouses, 
servants to men, despite the fact that the power structure between Abigail and John Proctor, uh, one of the main characters also makes him significantly more guilty in their unlawful relationship. And Abigail, the one character who deviates slightly from this mold, is ostracized from the community, which highlights some of the major themes of guilt, deception, and reputation. Um, I'll finish up, um, you know, with my thoughts of the crucible, um, the time period, um, by saying that as teachers, it is really essential for us to look at the historical background when we're teaching English language arts to give our students a full um, picture of what that time period was like um, in connection to history. Um, I can tell you that PBS uh, Learning has some amazing resources for teachers, and you will see that I put a lot of resources um, for you. At this time, I will turn things over to Alicia Butler, who's going to introduce you um, to Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Thank you, Vaina. Um... Now, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass definitely makes my top five books that broaden my outlook and perspective on life and U.S. history. Next slide. The a narrative was published in 1845, seven years after Frederick Douglass's escape. It was an instant success. It sold over 4,500 copies in the first four months. It is one of the most popular slave narratives written in American literature. Next slide. Some of the common literary themes that are explored across the country in many classrooms are truth and justice, specifically the hypocrisy of Christian enslavers, the inexpressibility of slavery and the horrors of slavery that can never really be accurately described. Um, he focused on fellowship, destruction of family, but also the formation of new kinship networks, uh, resistance. Frederick Douglass explores the different forms and ways that enslaved people fought back against the institution. And then lastly, he also highlights the self-destructiveness of slavery. And essentially, he's basically saying that slavery corrupts everyone. No one uh, leaves unscathed, the enslaver, nor those that are enslaved, and also the people that um, kind of are on the outside, on, on, the, on the outside looking in. All of these things are centered in the events in the historical context of the era. So I wanted to give us a minute, if you could, in the chat. Why don't you, I would love for you all to tell me, is there a theme that you think really resonates with your students when you have taught it? Or if you haven't taught it, is there a theme that you see here on your board that would really, really resonate with your students? Or is there a theme that you cover that isn't included and perhaps should be considered by more teachers? Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa already put in the chat that resistance really resonates with my students. Um, mine as well. That uh, leads to a lot of different conversations um, and a lot of insights and perspectives that the students provide that really make it a pleasure teaching. Um, we also have Andrea. She says truth and justice uh, really resonates for hers. Madison also agreeing with both um, Vanessa <laughs> and um, Andrea. Robert. Yeah, resistance. It seems as if that resistance and truth and justice really does um, resonate with our students. I would say definitely truth and justice, the resistance. Um, but one of the things that my students also find pretty interesting is the uh, idea about self-destructiveness of slavery in my classroom. It's one of the things that they never really think about. And that's one of the power, I think, of you know this book is that Frederick Douglass definitely does kind of give us that perspective as well. Um, all right, okay, endurance, resilience. I'm um, also, I wanna honor uh, what Sanford said. Sanford said, you know, he teaches a lot of Hispanic students and the book did not necessarily resonate with them and that he's looking for a unique strategy to help. And I definitely hope that I can provide that with you in the next uh, slides that we're gonna talk about. So sit tight, Sanford, and hopefully I can definitely kind of answer that question. That's really kind of the purpose of this um, webinar. So thank you for being honest in that. Next slide. All right. So 
some of these strategies that um, kind of go back to Sanford's point about how can you really make it resonate for other students. One of the things that I suggest that you could do is that before you have your students dive into the novel, first consider some activities that you could do to introduce them uh, to get them ready to tackle some of these themes that will also encourage them to establish a personal connection with Douglas's story, despite whatever their um, ethnic background is or nationality. So one of the ways to do this that perhaps might work with your students would be a warm up, a warm up that I do um, that also serves as a really good social emotional learning activity. You should first begin by asking the students, if you were given the opportunity to write an autobiography about your life, have the students list, what would you title it? What important events would you feel comfortable putting in the book? What are some aspects of where you live that you think would be essential to understanding your story? And some, what are some truths about your life that you would like to highlight? And then probably one of the, the main questions that you can ask them to really help to introduce the historical context within them would be, what are three to five events that happened this year, the year your novel will be published? that would be necessary to appreciating your story? And how important would it be for the reader to understand the time for what you were writing and living in in order to really understand your story? Um, you can have the students just simply list these questions and answer them, or you can even take it another level. You can give them kind of like a, a cutout of a, a blank uh, a book cover and then have them write their title and maybe you know have a, another page in the back that they can write their table of contents in and then also answer these questions verbally as a discussion. Next slide. And so after the warm up, you can also introduce students to Douglas himself and provide a historical context of the era in which he lived. Um, you could explain to the students that they're going to be reading an autobiography by an enslaved man who escaped slavery and became an important figure in US history. Now, I think this is really important because even though I'm not going to tell my age, but I know uh, maybe people in my age background and maybe some of the people that are out there in the chat, um, you know, Frederick Douglass might be a common person that maybe, you know, we already knew when we were our students age, it had already been taught or, or spoken to us like in our households, but a lot of the students today may not, many of our students are coming from different countries, all right, where they never heard of him before. Um, so a lot of them are really entering kind of like this novel without any um, background at all about him. And one of the ways that you could do this is that we really do have a great resource on PBS Learning. It's very short. Um, it's only like a minute and 49 um, uh, seconds that you can introduce to our students. And you can that can really kind of allow them to hear Frederick Douglass, you know, um, uh, see him and get them primed and ready uh, to dive into the book. So what I would like to do right now, um, I would like to just take a minute um, so we can take a look at this uh, resource. Um, and we're going to let you actually see the video and then we'll reconvene and talk about some strategies that you can use with us in a moment. I was born in Tuckahoe in Talbert County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age. By far the larger part of slaves know as little of their age as horses know of theirs. And it is the wish of most masters to keep their slaves thus ignorant. It's an expose about, of course, the horrible treatment of slaves. It's also an example of how the institution of slavery not only degrades slaves, but it degrades the master. Douglas listed dates, places, and most dangerous of all, his owner's name. One white friend read the document and advised Douglas to burn it. Should Douglas's owner ever want to reclaim his property, he warned, there was nothing anyone could do to protect him. Douglas would have none of it. It was truly a cultural event when he did publish it. It was uh, an immediate and an immense bestseller. That narrative was published in 1845 by 1846 to 1847, Douglas was a household name in the United States. Among those who read the book was Douglas's owner, Thomas Auld. He called Douglas a liar and vowed to track him down and send him to the cotton fields of the Deep South. Douglas fled the country for Great Britain.
All right. I hope you enjoyed that short segment. And this is one of the things I love about our resources is that a lot of us, we don't have time to show like major long, you know, lengthy um, documentaries, but a lot of our resources in our history collection are no more than five to six minutes, even six minutes is pushing it. So it's just enough time to really get our students, like I said, primed and ready. Um, and another thing that I like that I wanted to highlight about this is that the um, all of our resources are accompanied by discussion questions. And a lot of them are higher order thinking questions. These are things that immediately after watching the video, you can ask them you know, verbally as a classroom discussion. You can even print them out and have them answer it you know, in written form. And you know, some of the questions for this one is, you know, how did Douglas's point of view on the best way to fight to abolish slavery compared to other white abolitionists at the time? To what extent do you believe that pacifism is the best means of fighting injustice and immoral laws? That's a great question. Um, and to what extent do you believe that a movement or organization to defeat an oppressive system can be effective without it being led by those who have been oppressed by the system? And then what do you think that we can learn today from Douglas's autobiography? So this is another um, you know, resource that you can start with your students to try to get them interested if they have no familiarity with him. Another thing that I, I like to do is um, after having students watch this video, have them complete what I call a KWNL chart. Now I know a lot of us do KWL charts, but I, I kind of modified it. Um, I had the students write down, what do you now know? Like after they kind of watched the video or what did you know before you even watched the video? What do you want to know? But more importantly, what do you need to know? And that's usually what I give them. <laughs> um, and then at the end, what did you learn? And, you know, as far as what do you need to know, what you can do is in that section of the chart, give them the literary themes that you're going to be covering in the book and have them turn those themes into questions and have them put those questions in the need to know section. So as they're reading the book, you know, when you complete a chapter, you can have them say, all right, pick one of these things, you know, and what have you read so far that can be used to answer this literary theme in their KWNL chart. Um, now, before we go on, I want us to address the fact that many of us teach in schools with large communities of students where English is not their first language or with students that have IEPs. Our video resources can be modified and it can be adapted to meet their needs. So some of the strategies that you could use is you can actually go into the video um, and there's a little um, like a little turning wheel that you see in the right bottom left hand corner. Carolyn's pointing to it right now. A lot of times you can press click on that um, and that can you can decrease the playback speed so that it slows it down. You can also put on the closed caption, which is the CC there um, button right on right there where Carolyn's got her cursor. Another thing you can do, most of our videos are accompanied by a transcript. You can have the trans transcript, you can print it out for students that they can read along if they need to, or better yet, you can even take that transcript. And what I do is I print it out or I put it into Google, Google language um, and I'll change it to Spanish or I change it to, you know, Amharic for my students. Um, and then I give that to them and the students, maybe they can read it ahead of time. And then when they watch the film, they can follow along. Um, these are all strategies that are just great ways to make sure that we can adapt these resources to meet all the needs of our, our learners. Next slide. Now, we have a series of other video resources that can help provide additional historical context for students dealing with life on the plantation, the cotton gin, the second middle passage. See, many of us know about that first one, but we don't know about the second one, which is really important. And that second one is what um, really affected and impacted Frederick Douglass. Um, you can have students watch these videos and then predict, have them predict how they think the information, the historical information that they've learned in the videos um, might influence Douglass's story before they read it or the story that he's gonna tell. Um, other activities for providing historical context include having your students compete, uh, complete a Venn diagram. I call it your world versus Douglas's world. So after they watch these videos that give them great historical context, right? Have them use that to give them an idea, okay, what is the world Frederick Douglass is writing in, right? And then how does that compare to your world today in 2023? Have them compare and contrast it in a Venn diagram. Um, and, you know, you can also, after having the students kind of like watch this, these videos to give them historical context, have them use that information and jot it down in their L section of their KWNL chart. Next slide. 
Lastly, a final project that I do with my students and uh, have them complete after they've read the novel is a digital history collage. Like I said, I am a history teacher. Um, I do work very closely with my um, the language arts teachers and English teachers in my school. Um, after we're done reading the book, I'll have students research, copy and paste into a document or even a PowerPoint. If your students have um, computers, they'll do a PowerPoint slide where they'll have like five primary source images that they've researched that provide historical support for the arguments that Douglas makes about the institution of slavery and all its effects. So after they've read the novel, after they understand really kind of what his argument is, dealing with the literary themes, have them go out, explore, find some primary source images, you know, do a history collage that actually support what he argues about the time period that he's living in and his views on, on slavery and what it really does to people, all people that are affected by it. Next slide. Now, another book that many of us teach in our classrooms is The Great Gatsby. Um, it's very popular in our schools because it's accessible, relatable, familiar, um, you know, it's commonly used to address major themes such as the American experience, classism, and the prevailing, cur prevailing curse of feelings of otherness. It's set in 1922, which is one of my favorite periods of time, but it was written in 1924. However, in some districts, it's also used as the sole literary text to describe the American experience in the 1920s. And I have a little issue with this because I really encourage student, uh, teachers when I'm speaking to them to really think, are we really, you know, having our students and are we really using Gatsby in a way that can provide opportunities to discuss the experiences of unheard voices during the 1920s and not just one community of people, the community of people that Gatsby belongs to or is trying to belong to. Next slide. So when we're teaching the 1920s historical context, all right, my, many of us out there, I'm sure we all hit the following events on this page. The end of the Great War, the you know, end of the Spanish flu, the rise of the billionaires, the arrival of the new immigrants, and the rise of the cities. But I'd like to take a couple seconds real quick. Just tell me, what are some events that are important to introduce to our students uh, about the 1920s um, that may not be on this page? Can you go ahead and put it in the chart, chat? What do you think is missing? What should we teach? Or what are some things that you teach about this time period that you don't necessarily see? Ooh, Robert, the Great Migration, the Harlem Renaissance, Beth. Thank you. I'm glad I can hear that. <laughs> Prohibition, yes, the rise of organized crime. That's what I'm talking about. The jazz age, my favorite. I am definitely a jazz head. I love, love, love it. All right. Um, 1920 slang, communication, the rise of the Klan. That's what I'm talking about. Republican era economics. Y'all are awesome. Tulsa, the boring 20s and 19th Amendment. And it just goes on and on. I love it. Go to the next slide. <laughs> That's awesome. And in here, it's funny, many of y'all already hit it. I just implore you, if you didn't think about it, you know, things that are missing that we should. We, we hit it in the chat, the Great Migration. That's in there as well. We should be talking about this. The Harlem Renaissance, absolutely. Don't forget, though, Garvey's Back to Africa movement. That should also be included. Don't forget the Red Summer. These are all things that are just as equally as important as those kind of low-hanging fruit events that were on the preceding slide. Excellent job. Um, like I said, you know, the... Uh, Great migration, it's important. It's the largest internal migration ever to take place. Six million black people leaving the South, relocating into the North and the West and the Midwest. Harlem Renaissance, you know, explosion in artistic pursuits of expression by black Americas. If you're not familiar, Garvey's Black Back to Africa movement, where you know many blacks in America are saying, yo, it's time to bounce and forever leave America and Jim Crow and let's move back to Africa where we can truly thrive and be independent. The Red Summer, which we'll talk about in a second. You know, in addition, in addition to pursuing the American dream, like Gatsby, Black people in the U.S. are experiencing, you know, one of the largest, largest migrations I've ever witnessed. Next slide. And these are things that we need to talk about. So some of the suggested activities that, you know, I like to kind of use with my students um, is, you know, talking mainly about how can we really get our students to walk in their shoes. And one of the ways that we do this is I have students um, research hit songs of the 1920s so we can get that jazz age that y'all were talking about, right? Um, and have students construct a playlist for great migrationers. If they had to have a playlist to listen to as they're moving, you know, north or to the Midwest, what are some songs that they would use or 
even what's the playlist of today that you think that would be great for them to really embody the this historical event. Another activity, they have lots of the actual letters written from great migrant migrationers and their experience that you can get online. Have the students read these letters real quickly to really get them to understand, you know, the spirit of the great migration. Next slide. I really, and we also on that um, preceding slide before we moved on, we had a video that we have on PBS Learning about the Great Migration that's really good. You can have the students, you know, read a one-way ticket. If we don't have time in our classrooms to do the whole Harlem Renaissance, you know, there's ways that you can hit kind of like both events. Langston Hughes, Harlem Renaissance um, poet, one-way ticket, a poem about the Great Migration. All right, have the students, you know, uh, try to identify as a uh, point of view. What are the opportunities uh, that you know Black people have in the South or a lack of opportunities? And what are the opportunities that they have in the North? What specific, specific issues is he saying in this poem that he's fleeing and where's he specifically going? All right, one way ticket, great resource. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, as I said earlier, and I was going to talk about the Red Summer, the Red Summer was a period of immense racial violence against great migrationers and returning Black world, Black World War I soldiers. I really love it. One of my favorite actresses is um, Cicely Tyson. In her autobiography, she said before she died, um, which was such a great loss, that, you know, the, you know, Roaring Twenties might have warred for white people, but for a lot of Black people, it moaned. And one of the, you know, a great, you know, evidence for that was the Red Summer. Tulsa wasn't the only massacre though. We need to understand that in 1919 alone, violence erupted in places like Chicago, DC, where I teach currently, New York, you know, Memphis, Tennessee, Philly, Charleston, South Carolina, Baltimore, New Orleans, Delaware, Nebraska, Connecticut, places that we don't usually think about, you know, but like I said, Tulsa was not the only one. You had the Coe massacre in my home state of Florida, the Rosewood massacre also in, in my home state of Florida. You know, Gatsby can use his veteran status in America to his advantage, whereas Black soldiers could not be. They, you know, were threatened with lynching for walking down the streets in major U.S. cities. And so my question is, are we really, as teachers, are we using Gatsby to also explore the sense of otherness that Black soldiers are feeling? All right, their experience is totally different from Great Gatsby, even though what they're trying to achieve is the same, trying to move up in society. So what I'd like to do real quickly is to just take a, a moment. Carolyn, could you please go into this particular um, resource and click on the ISA? When I teach the Red Summer with my students, what I do is I usually, I'll go to the PPS learning site. And what I'll do is I will begin this activity by going to where it says independent student activity. And it is a great spin. I, we kind of adapted it. And instead of regular, I see think wonder activity, I see think predict and then learned activity. And basically what it is, it's just taking a moment to pop up. Hmm. Yep, there you go. This is an image from a video clip that I'm getting ready to show you. And it's basically an image of a, um, a group of, of individuals in during the Chicago uh, race riots, unfortunately, in which they burned down a, um, a black uh, a Chicagoans residence. And in front of it, you can see them cheering. There's children of all ages. I'll have the students, I'll give them this and I'll say, you know, what do you see? And they write it down. And then I ask them to, you know, what do you think about what you're looking at and how it kind of relates to the essential question. Um, and then I ask them like, what do you wonder about like this particular, um, you know, incident in history, um, the Chicago race riots. Um, and then what I do is after they've kind of like, you know, analyze the photograph, I then go into the video. And so we're gonna show a very short segment of this video. Um, and then um, we'll regroup and I'll explain how you can further use this strategy after um, students are done watching the video. Jim Crow was following the great migration northward and both had landed in Chicago. In the last two years alone, an estimated 50,000 black people had arrived in the city, almost doubling Chicago's African-American population. New arrivals crowded up uneasily against a huge influx of immigrants fleeing Southern and Eastern Europe. Those European migrants were divided by religion, language, and ethnicity. But they held one thing in common, an antipathy toward black people. 
business owners exploited racial tensions, frequently using black workers to undercut wages and break strikes. Marion Anderson travels to Chicago in 1919. That's basically a powder keg. And it has many of the conditions that you'll see in cities across the country. So there's pressure on housing. There's competition over jobs. There are returning soldiers, black and white. Black soldiers angry about their World War I experience and convinced that they've earned their full citizenship right. And white soldiers determined to keep African Americans from acting on their convictions. July 27th, 14-year-old Eugene Williams was killed when his raft drifted into the white section of the 29th Street Beach. A policeman refused to arrest his assailant. Fights broke out between black and white bystanders. While Anderson was at the Chicago Musical College preparing for the most important performance of her life, the rising tide of racial violence came crashing down around her. There were rampaging mobs moving through black neighborhoods. Rumors circulating about violence being done all over the city. Bodies riddled with bullets or set afire. No one quite sure about all of the things going on, but knowing it was bad. Over five days, 23 African Americans and 15 whites were killed in Chicago, and 500 people injured. But the All right, so we'll actually stop right there for the sake of time. It is an amazing resource. Like I said, it's only five minutes long, but after students finish watching the video, they go back to that image, and now they, with the notes that they've taken, they reevaluate that image, and they use all that information to create a brief constructed response that's answering the essential question um, of basically kind of like the causes of the red summer and how it impacted, um, you know, um, the Black people's ability to access us the American dream. It's really, really powerful. Um, and then after you do that, you know, you can have discussions that really kind of where students understand like that this is, you know, what Black people are going through, Black soldiers, Black people living in the city versus what you're reading Great Gatsby and Gatsby's experience. Next slide. To wrap up, I also wanted to leave with one other great interactive um, lesson. It's one on Ocean Suite. A lot of us may not be familiar with him, but we should, because he is a great figure that students could learn about when they uh, and they can use that to compare his experience with that of Great Gatsby. Um, he was an um, African American um, physician in Detroit, Michigan. He's he was known for being charged with murder in 1925. After he, his wife, and child and friends used armed resistance to protect their house from a violent racist mob who was angry that he had moved into an all-white neighborhood. It's a fascinating story of a man like Gatsby trying to change his destiny. He grew up in poor Florida, saw his first lynching. He was a young boy, left Florida, went to an HBCU, pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He graduated. He became a doctor. He and along and his brother, friends, and wife, like I said, they were arrested. They were sent to prison while they awaited their trial for defending their house. He does get off. The great um, uh, Clarence Darrow defends him, but his wife and child, they die of tuberculosis later on that they contracted while they were in jail. He ends up committing suicide later in life. Um, but this really does help students to explore the major, major historical events of his life. And this one interactive, you learn about the Jim Crow South, the Great Migration, what about the prevalence of HBCUs during this time period? That's also something important to the 1920s. The rise of the Black middle class, also important to the 1920s. Northern housing discrimination, also important. Rise of the Klan, racial mob violence. All this is the 1920s, the same time that Gatsby is existing, right? Next slide. And then have our students do a Venn diagram. Have the students compare Gatsby versus Ocean Suites and the Americas in which they're, they're living in the 1920s. What about Daisy Buchanan that's in the book, right? And her life, 
have uh, why don't you uh, have them you know compare Daisy Buchanan with Gladys Mitchell Ocean Sweet's wife and their destinies right and how their lives also ended in the 1920s it's a great way to you know to really express and explore um, women in the 1920s um, so hopefully I gave you enough strategies that can really help the Great Gatsby you know come alive um, to your students and the narrative and I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Odlum that's going to give us some uh, strategies for teaching life in the 1950s and the civil rights movement. Thank you, Alicia. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first text that I'm going to talk about is the Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. So this is a really popular middle school book. However, if you're a high school teacher and you have students who are reading below grade level, this is a good option um, that you can incorporate into your classroom. So the novel is set in the 1960s. The story is told from the first person point of view of Kenny, a 10 year old boy. A little bit later, I'll also talk about the importance of uh, teaching the civil rights movement from the perspective of young people. And so that's one of the reasons why I really love this book. So Kenny lives in Flint, Michigan. However, his family travels to Birmingham over the summer to visit their grandmother. There's a little controversy around why they actually have to go there. Um, but when you read the book, you'll see. Um, and then the climax of the novel is the bombing of a Black church, which is an allusion to the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of historical context, so I taught, as Carolyn mentioned before, I taught middle school for a long time. I also taught high school. And with both groups of students, uh, um, teaching historical context was always really important because it's the foundation of them reading historical fiction. They cannot understand an author's social commentary or fully understand the themes of the novel if they don't understand um, the historical context of the events that occur in the text. So one amazing resource from PBS Learning Media is this civil rights hotspots. So students should understand that the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was shaped by major events that occurred in specific cities. Students can explore the civil rights hotspots map and timeline, um, and then teachers can ask students to identify trends on the timeline, what factors contributed to cities being identified as civil rights hotspots. Um, teachers can also ask which states had multiple major civil rights incidents. What does that reveal about the political climate of those states during that era? Okay, so we have a lot of history and even like humanities folks here. What would you think, which states or cities would you think would be on this timeline? You could just drop that in the chat. Yes, definitely Mississippi, right? Obviously Alabama, which the story is set. Yeah, Birmingham specifically, Memphis, et cetera. So students can start to see these trends develop when they look at the timeline. It's very interesting. Next slide, please. So another resource um, is uh, the resource on George Wallace, who was the governor of Alabama. In order to properly contextualize the events that occur in the novel, teachers must provide students with opportunities to learn about the role that Alabama played in the civil rights movement, right? So the geographical um, things that happened, right, that made Alabama such a um, major player in a negative way in the civil rights movement. So after watching George Wallace and the politics of seg segregation, students can identify Wallace's political beliefs, the ways he appealed to working class whites, and how he defied federal mandates for integration. A lot of students don't get that perspective. Students can analyze how Wallace's politics created the envir environment that would lead Alabama to becoming a civil rights hotspot. And students can also analyze how politicians use platforms of hate and anti-Blackness to gain political power. So what I like about this resource, and I know a, a few questions were talking about students having like background knowledge and context, so, um, you know, we have to tap in in different ways. So it's not that they don't they don't have any kind of content, um, background knowledge or context, but we have to tap in in certain ways. So this video starts with a discussion of Donald Trump and how Trump used fear as his political platform and then says there's a history of politicians who did similar things. And one of those politicians is was George Wallace. So students can relate and connect in that particular way, just make it relevant to their current situation. Next slide, please. Um, so students do have, especially when it comes to Alabama, students, once they've passed fifth grade, they have some type of um, background knowledge of the march from Selma to Montgomery. 
um, whether they realize it or not, right? They've encountered it in either a textbook, watching the movie, et cetera. So to tap into that prior knowledge, you can use this resource, Selma to Montgomery on PBS Learning Media. Teachers can ask students to think about the importance of allyship in the fight for voting rights in Alabama. And you can easily connect that to the present day, right? It, with our all of the social justice issues that are happening right now, we need allies to bring about change. And that march is the perfect, just looking at the imagery, right, from that march uh, proves that. Students can identify the ways young people supported the voting rights movement in Alabama and the significance of their actions on the movement. Again, making students feel like, see other young people who were engaged and made change, and hopefully they can see themselves as change makers as well. Teachers can ask students to reflect on social justice issues that they're passionate about and to begin brainstorming ways they can support those causes. Next slide. And then the final um, resource is the 16th Street Baptist Church um, resource on PBS Learning Media. So the civil rights movement is primarily taught from an adult perspective. We really learn about the ways that children were impacted. If you teach the civil rights movement um, from a youth perspective, please let us know in the chat and what resources you use. Um, so Christopher Paul Curtis's novel gives a voice to the experiences of children living through the civil rights movement. The 16th Street Baptist Church resource documents the firsthand accounts of women who survived the bombing. So many of these women in this video, it's the first time that they're um, talking about the impact of the event. As many of you know, um, our former Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, was actually a friend of the young girls who um, perished in that fire. She was not at church that day, but she could have easily been there. So that is also an interesting connection that can be made. Um, and while students are watching the video, they can take notes on the emotional toll the bombing had on the survivors and the impact that fear had on the people of Birmingham. A good class discussion slash debate would be about what role do schools play in addressing racial violence that plagues their communities. One of the um, survivors in the video, she states that when she got to, back to school, it was business as usual. No one asked, no one talked about the event. No one asked them how they felt. It was just like it never happened, right? We live in a different climate where schools have a responsibility to address those things. Some schools, not all. Um, so it would just be a really good um, debate or discussion to have with your students. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of literary analysis, um, you can do some great character analysis, especially with the protagonist of the story. So consider the ways that Kenny's character develops throughout the story. How does he change? What were the factors that led to those changes? He starts out kind of naive and innocent. And then because he experiences what he experiences, you know, there's some trauma there. What does Kenny's character reveal about the impact of injustice? in terms of author's craft. So in the story, Kenny's sister is supposed to be at church, but she leaves and goes home. Kenny doesn't know that. So he goes to look for her and he sees the aftermath and aftermath of the bombing. Uh, Christopher Paul Curtis beautifully illustrates that. So you can have students do some real analytical work with the imagery and what message uh, Paul Curtis was trying to convey. And then in terms of themes, two of the themes, childhood innocence, what is Curtis's message about innocence and African-American children? And then the psychological impact of racism, what was the psychological effect of the church bombing on Kenny? How did witnessing the bombing ch change his behavior when he returns to Flint? He's very afraid, he's hiding behind the couch. Um, and then how did he learn to cope with that trauma? Next slide, please. And then so the three additional recommended resources that you'll also receive when you um, get the email of resources focus on teaching about youth during the civil rights movement. So one um, on the murder of Emmett Till. Emmett Till's journey is very similar to the protagonist. They come from the Midwest. They go to the um, South. Unfortunately, Emmett Till perished. Um, then there's one about educational equality with a focus on the Little Rock Nine and Ruby Bridges. And then the last one, which I only learned about preparing for this, is about the girl of Leesburg Stockade. Now, these were uh, middle school students, middle school girls who protested in civil rights movements and they were um, incarcerated because of it. And in this um, clip, this is the first time in the documentary that they're actually talking about their experience. So that is a really um, interesting and engaging resource. Next slide, please. Okay, so now Beloved by Toni Morrison, we all know Toni Morrison. So um, 
obviously with beloved because of the content this is something that you would teach in upper high school maybe ap course honor courses if anyone has taught beloved please let us know or if there's some concerns about it you can also drop that in the chat um so it's set in the antebellum through postbellum era setha the novel's protagonist is based on margaret garner a formerly enslaved woman who became victim of the fugitive slave act of 1850. When U.S. Marshals found Garner and her family in hiding, she had killed her youngest daughter in an attempt to protect her from becoming enslaved. Beloved often falls on the banned books list because of its depictions of the realities of American slavery, rape, murder, and psychological trauma. At the end of my presentation, I'll provide you with two resources that you can use um, to justify the teaching of Beloved if that is of interest to you. Okay, so in terms of the historical context, um, okay, it's important for students to understand the concept of chattel slavery, right? That African Americans were considered property. The resource conditions of antebellum slavery, 1830 to 1860, is a thorough overview of the harmful conditions that African Americans had to endure. So I really like this resource because it talks about like how they, um, the food that they ate, right? How that was uh, dehumanizing to them, the different tasks that they had to um, fulfill because students don't know every single thing, right? Everyone just thinks about, oh, picking cotton or house duties, but this goes into specifics of the type of duties that they had to um, fulfill. So you can ask students, in what ways were African-Americans dehumanized, consider what they ate, the types of tasks they had to fulfill and the laws they had to abide by during this time. Next slide. Um, obviously you have to talk about the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, so it's important to, uh, for students to understand the role that federal legislation played in maintaining the institution of slavery, even in free states. You can watch this video. As Alicia said, all of the, the resources are in small digestible bits, but you get everything you need to know. So even though this is one minute and six seconds, whatever students need to know about the Fugitive Slave Act, they'll learn from that video. So what led to the creation of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850? How did the mandates of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 stifle the abolitionist efforts in the North? And how did the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 re-traumatize free African-Americans? Next slide, please. Um, Okay, also, so Beloved is about um, a lot about family, right? So Seth's decision to murder her children is seen as deplorable. However, Morrison's inclusion of this detail from Margaret Garner's life illustrates the way slavery destroyed the Black family. This wonderful series, Mercy Street, is um, there are uh, excerpts of it on uh, PBS Learning Media. And um, when you click on the link, you'll see like two other videos underneath. They're all really short, so you can show all three, but they really show the importance of family to African-Americans during that time. So after watching the video, students can respond to the following questions. African-Americans were considered to be three-fifths of a person based on the U.S. Constitution. How does the portrayal of enslaved African-Americans in Mercy Street subvert that claim? And why do you think slaveholders did not want African-Americans to marry? Next slide. Um, okay, in terms of literary analysis, analysis, the characters, because it's Toni Morrison, the characters are so complex and there's so much to analyze. So students can consider the impact Beloved has on Setha, Paul D. in Denver, in what ways does she motivate them and what ways does she hold them back? If you've never read the text, Beloved comes back. This is the, the child that Setha murdered. She comes back first as a, a baby and then comes back as a grown, as a spirit of a baby, and then comes back um, as a, an adult woman. Um, and so each ca main character has a very complicated relationship with her. What does Beloved symbolize in the novel? Consider the ways in which Denver changes throughout the novel. So Denver is Setha's um, daughter. And Setha and Denver live a very isolated life because um, they, the Black community doesn't accept them because she killed her baby. And also, you know, um, they escaped, they were on the run. So how does Denver come of age despite her circumstances? When Beloved shows up, she takes all of her mother's attention away from Denver, but still Denver comes of age. And then how does Paul D's character subvert stereotypes of Black men during that time period? Next slide. And then three, there are many themes, but three themes, the psychological trauma of slavery. How does Morrison show the psychological trauma that slavery has on African-Americans in general, general African-American women, African-American men, and white people? And so that's something that Toni Morrison in her essays, documentaries, et cetera, she always wanted to emphasize that racism doesn't just affect people of color, it also impacts white people. So that's a good conversation to have. The complexities of womanhood and slavery. What does the novel 
veil about the tensions between the expectations of women and mothers during that time period, right? This is a time period where it's like the cult of true womanhood and what wom womanhood looks like. But what does that mean for a Black woman and for an enslaved Black woman? And how does that um, uh, influence the decisions that she makes, like killing her child? The resilience of the African-American family. What do we learn about the resilience of the African-American family in the novel? How is the notion of family redefined, right? Because community becomes family for African-Americans since they're all being bought and sold. Um, how does family become a survival mechanism? Next slide. So in terms of justification for teaching Beloved, PBS Learning Media has an excellent resource. It's called The Pain of History and Beloved. And the speakers in the video acknowledge the importance of Morrison's brutal honesty, the beauty of her prose, and the healing power of the story. There are educators from all walks of life in this video, so it's a great resource. And then also NCTE has a book rationale database. It's amazing. You'll receive a link to it. And so our resource on um, the justification of teaching Beloved was created by one of our past presidents. Is Dr. Jocelyn Chadwick. And so she explains why it should be taught in the secondary classroom. Thank you. Wow. Um, all right. We went a little long. We apologize, but we have so much to share. And I, I appreciate you hanging in with us. We did, we're scheduled to run until 8.15 and we're just going to wind down right now. If you do have something uppermost on your mind that you're going to, that you're taking away from the webinar, something that you might be using your teaching right away or want to share with someone, please put it in the chat and that'll get, kind of give us an idea of what has resonated with you. Um, this is just a quick reminder that many of the resources that you saw come from pbslearningmedia.org, a free website, and the U.S. History Collection, which is a part of PBS Learning Media. These are just uh, banners and you have links in the resource document of other collections on PBS Learning Media that I thought would be of interest to ELA and history teachers. And, um, and then I wanted to give a nod to two series uh, from Masterpiece, World on Fire and Atlantic Crossing, both related to World War II and resources from those. Okay, um, Ashante is in the room uh, from NS NCSS. Ashante, do you want to um, tell us a little bit more about your conference? Yes, hi everyone, I'm Ashante Horton. I'm the NCSS Meetings and Education Manager. Um, our conference that Larry has brought up earlier uh, is taking place in Nashville, December of uh, first through third, and we are so proud that we will have some of our GBH education um, people there doing their own presentations. So we would love for you all to be able to join us. Uh, as you can see, we are at socialstudies.org backslash conference for any of those uh, questions. And I'm sure that that will also be on the resource document as well, if you want to link to that and, and go ahead and check us out. Great. And, and I'll mention that in the resource document, I did say that we have lots more than just what was mentioned tonight. And both NCTE and NCSS generally, gener what's the word, generously shared many, many resources. And you'll find them um, towards the end of the document. Okay, Lisa from NCTE. Hi there, I'm Lisa Fink. I work in professional development and member engagement. Um, we have a conference right before NCSS. We'll be in Columbus, Ohio, um, starting on November 16th. We've got QR codes on this slide um, and also in your resource document. So you can join our convention. You don't have to be a member to attend our convention. But if you are interested in membership, and that's the best way to access that book rationale database that Lakeisha mentioned um, you can become a member at the QR code um, on the screen or at the link that you will get later. And thank you all so much. And thank you. I, I want to thank all of the presenters. If you want to come back on camera while people are looking at the links, that would be great. Baina and Lakeisha and Alicia and NCT and NCSS, thank you very, very much. We do offer, um, uh, encourage you to complete a brief survey. We pay very close attention to the results of the survey. 
And after completing it, you can download a certificate, uh, either if you are part of the live stream tonight or watching the recording. Uh, we give you a couple of weeks to do that. The resource document link is here, but I imagine uh, Denise might have posted in the chat. And again, you'll get it in an email tomorrow. Uh, and then we, this is one of many, many webinars that we run. We have a whole series on U.S. history. We also have done many on um, directly related to ELA teachers. I can think of one we did last year on Masterpiece and Poetry. And all of those webinars are recorded and on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Carolyn Jacobs in the GBH Education Department. You are welcome to email me with any questions or comments, and I'll get you to the right people. Um, we are at time, but is there anything pressing, uh, Denise, that you want to call our attention to or any final words? And we'll keep the chat open for another minute or so. Uh, no questions that went unanswered, but I uh, agree with one of the comments that I want to be in the classrooms of all of these people. Um, yeah, this was a great webinar. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, a lot of work and passion went into this and uh, we're thrilled to be able to share it with you and our partners. And I wish you all um, a great rest of the school year and thank you for all the work that you do. I'll keep the chat open for another minute and then um, presenters, you are welcome to go put your kids to bed or whatever you need to do. And thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>